All right, good afternoon. Um, I'm PJ Waskevich. Um, I'm here with Anjali Singhai Jain. Uh, we work for the networking division at Intel, and we're going to be talking about some of the work uh, that we're pursuing with um, XTP acceleration using hardware hints. So the obligatory agenda slide, um, everyone should know what XTP is by now, but um, we'll go over the brief software model, kind of highlighting the areas that we're trying to target uh, with the work that we're doing, and then describe what we mean by hardware hints in XTP programs. Um, have some performance results. It's always good to use performance as a benchmark whether or not you're on the right track with something. Uh, then we're going to talk about metadata layout considerations, and this is an area that we're still under debate, and we'll be looking at the community for which way we want to go. Uh, and then Anjali will go into um, some of the dynamic uh, things with programming the hints, requesting hints, and then we'll uh, wrap up. All right, so just a brief recap for those who aren't intimately familiar with what XTP actually does. Um, it does make things go fast, but how? Um, so the packet parsing engine for XDP is to first identify the packet type. Right? It starts parsing packet, raw packet data that was DMA'd out of the NIC and handed off to the XTP core. And once we identify the packet type, then we can start parsing it. So we'll start extracting information out of the packet data, whether it's in the header, whether it's in the payload. It really depends on what your XDP program is trying to do. So based on that use case, uh, we might monitor incoming traffic on the network, you know, maybe make some counters as to say, I've seen some ARPs or I've been seeing some you know, broadcast traffic, anything that you're trying to do. Um, XTP programs may manipulate packets in the case of encapsulation, decap, um, forwarding. You might want to swap source destination addresses and fire it back out on transmit. Uh, and then you might do some computations. You might compute hashes or have to recompute uh, re checksums for any packets that you modified. Uh, and then based on uh, map lookups, um, and then based on all of the other information that you've accumulated, the XTP program makes a decision uh, whether to drop, uh, accept the packet, transmit it, redirect it, et cetera, et cetera, and then passes that back to the driver to tell it what to do. So this is the basic format uh, of what these things do, and they are getting much more complex as uh, things are evolving. Uh, for those of you who were at Andy and Jesper's talk yesterday about XTP, kind of gave a good sequel to uh, the last NetDev, um, showing how much XTP's evolved uh, in a very short amount of time. And it's not a coincidence that the core has evolved, it's really because the programs are demanding it. So our goal with the work that we're going to show you today is what can we use with present day hardware, right? So if you have um, older, older hardware, um, can it do anything to help accelerate XDP? And we believe it can. Um, so in the terms of packet processing, uh, we might be able to extract things like we identify packet type, or we might be able to figure out where a header starts um, in the hardware. Uh, so if we're able to do that and somehow tell XDP about it, then we can offset some of the CPU cycles that are used for this packet processing, right? Uh, I think Jason just mentioned in his last talk that if you have less code to run, usually you go faster. So if we're able to offset some of these computations in XDP, then we have less instructions to compute uh, on the CPU for that process. Um, we also want to keep this consistent with how XDP works today. Right, well, big point is to avoid uh, kernel changes as, as much as possible. Right, if you want to filter on something new or you want to identify a new header or a new packet, you don't want to have to go ahead and inject some new patches uh, or change some structs um, for that functionality. You want to just go ahead and adjust your XDP program, reload it, and you're off and running. Um, now, being a hardware vendor, um, Keeping it as hardware agnostic as much as possible is usually the antithesis of what you're trying to do because you're trying to make something that goes fast on your stuff. But this is a 
general purpose framework that we would really like to play well uh, with everyone else uh, that uses this. So our goal is really to try to keep uh, any hardware specific bits out of this. Um, the best effort acceleration, this is really getting down to kind of the previous slide about we're trying to use uh, current day hardware or even older day hardware. So if one network interface card um, may have an offload and another NIC in another system doesn't have that same offload, then we want to make sure that XTP doesn't fall over. Um, we either can use the hint that comes out of the hardware that provides it, and then if it doesn't provide it, maybe we can provide a software fallback. Uh, that's still TBD. Um, so the other two goals are, really, we want to also expose the flexibility um, as NICs become smarter, you know, this whole smart NIC move. Um, NICs are going to be exposing uh, packet processing pipelines that are programmable uh, way beyond what they are today. Um, so we want to find a way to generically use XDP um, in any fashion to help teach it which hints that we are actually interested in. And we believe that if we can really put the bits in place inside of XDP to harness all of this capability and flexibility to um, provide hints, program hints, extract hints, um, that'll make future hardware designs much more interesting because they'll have uh, more capabilities in the stack not requiring kernel changes. So this is just a simple um, diagram kind of outlining the, the flow that was back on the um, data flow. So the bottom part here is really um, down on the hardware and it really signifies kind of how a packet parser works in, in the NIC, right? So first thing is that you identify what the packet type is internally to the parser and the hardware. Then you start extracting things that you've been told to extract, whether it's you know a five tuple or four tuple. Um, you might do some map lookups. You may uh, compute some things like a RSS hash, for example. And then this metadata thing is what we'll get into with the hardware hints. And this is going to be, can we populate some metadata to then pass off to um, XTP through the XTP packet buffer. So this is all good, um, but to kind of boil down, what are the two problems that we are trying to solve right now? Um, the first one is how do we dynamically program the hardware, right? So some hardware is more programmable than others right now. That won't be the case in the future. Um, so how can we in tandem program the hardware to work with the XTP program that is going to try to parse and use the hints that it's going to be providing. So that's one problem, and Anjali is going to talk about that. Um, the other problem is how do we then, once we have that data coming out of the hardware, how do we pass it off from the driver into XTP? Um, and that is going to be uh, something that I'll talk about. So uh, that didn't render very well. Um, so Daniel Borkman had a patch set, and this was mentioned in uh, Andy's and Jesper's talk, uh, that there was a recent patch that went in that added this uh, data meta pointer, which I love the name, by the way, and it screws me up all the time instead of metadata. Um, but there's this data meta pointer that was added to allow um, passing data from the, S or from the XDP core into the uh, SKBs that could be used later up in the stack. And they kind of hide it in the headroom that is allocated as part of the XDP packet buffer. So we looked at it and said, heck, we can go ahead and stick something in there from the driver to XDP. Um, and it works kind of like the, the, the CB, the control block in the SK buff, that once you go up to the next layer, it's no guarantee that it's going to survive, and we really don't care. So this is where we're going to start hiding our metadata, or packaging it, I guess, should be a better word. All right. so. Before we get into the how, um, and then people can start uh, heckling, uh, we'll talk about the performance, because that'll kind of help smooth the, uh, the road. Um, this is all internal testing. This wasn't done by uh, any of our official perf labs, um, so numbers are TPD. But uh, the target was an Ivy Bridge uh, Xeon system. We were using the 25 gig um, I40E device. Uh, single RxQ, pinned interrupt, blah, blah, blah. 
And then we had a couple uh, XDP programs. So the first thing that we did was take a benchmark of XDP1. So the sample XDP1 in the kernel, which parses out um, data, identifies the packet type, and then if it's an IBV4 packet, it increments a counter in the maps and then drops it. So it identifies the packet by reading the packet data that came over from the driver and then drops it. XDP3 was a modified version of that that we wanted to see what is the absolute fastest way that we can drop a packet. So we said we're not going to parse the packet at all and we're just going to drop it. So this should show the delta between what is the hit by reading the packet buffer itself. Then XDP hints is a modification of XDP1, which is still go ahead and check if it's an IPv4 packet, but use a hint that's provided by the driver. So don't parse it in the XDP program. So reading this left to right, um, the first three bars uh, correspond to non-JIT, um, and then the last three bars are the same programs JITted. Um, so the important one here is, look at the yellow one, which is right there. Um, so that is about seven and a half-ish, eight million packets per second. Oh, do I have a little zappy thing? All right, sweet. So this is about seven and a half million packets per second with the packet parsing to drop. Um, then XTP3, which is just pure drop, um, we cap out at like 21 million packets per second. So then the XTP hints, which again is the same as XTP1, but using the hint out of the driver, um, still doing the drop if it's IPv4, we hit the same cap. Um, this cap we found is an artificial cap um, because of some limitations with certain counters that were on in our NIC when we were doing the benchmarking. So uh, we know that this can go faster. Uh, we just didn't have the time to adjust the test before uh, NetDev. Um, but to look at the non-JIT version, so XDP3 non-JIT is about 18 million packets per second. Again, this is the just pure drop, no parsing. And then the XTP hints is about 14 million. So extrapolating this, I would imagine that we would see kind of that same uh, delta. But it's still a pretty dramatic increase from XTP1 where we're actually doing the packet parsing itself. Um, so right now, at the cap, we're looking at about a 3x increase in performance. So next steps that we know that we want to do, um, I think Jesper had this comment um, offline uh, to me, which was, uh, can we look at uh, newer Xeon systems? Um, so Broadwell, maybe Skylake, um, and see if we have any uh, DDIO, uh, direct data IO performance improvements. Um, we also want to, right now, the, the way that we have the, the patches, which are kind of a hack, um, we do mem copies into the, um, into that XTP metadata location. So maybe we can do some tricks there with doing direct EMAs if we can. Uh, we want to go ahead and explore that and see um, just how much of a hit that mem copy is. Uh, and then obviously we need to test with bigger XTP programs. Um, NCAP, DCAP, uh, load balancer, et cetera, et cetera. So that's kind of the next steps where we're going to go after this. All right, so now the fun part. Um, so we're trying to figure out how do we actually stick this data in the metadata fields, right? And so we, uh, we came up with three approaches. Um, these are going to be the points of discussion, I think, uh, in the community, and that's the whole point that we brought this here. Um, the first approach is to define a common layout independent of underlying hardware. So actually build a struct that we're going to stick in the XTP meta location, or data meta. Um, this, I think, is going to be a pretty big lift, right? This is now imposing ABI on that uh, location. Um, the community would have to agree on it. The hardware vendors would also have to agree on it um, based on whatever types of metadata that they're producing out of their hardware. Uh, so once we defined it and merged it, um, it's going to be pretty, pretty rigid. Um, so I'm not a huge fan of this, but, but you know, if that's the way that we go, that's the way we go. Uh, the second approach is to put in vendor libraries in the eBPF, in BPF lib. So have some wrappers with some helper functions. Um, this would uh, require your XDP programs 
to detect the underlying hardware um, in order to know which, um, which helper to call. And I'm not sure that that's going to be particularly nice. We don't know how much overhead that will cause with all of the layers of indirection, but it's another approach we thought about. And the last one we kind of had this um, shortly before this conference is what if we chain XTP programs? Um, so there was some recent work to allow this to happen uh, in, in BPF. Uh, so we would have a lightweight shim attached to the driver itself uh, that would contain the vendor specific logic. And then we would have a, uh, another bigger program which is like maybe your load balancer or your NCAT DCAP that has all your business logic um, that would be tail called into um, with the metadata passed in. Um, this one still has a lot of work to do to see if this is even feasible. Um, but, oh wow, that looks really terrible. Uh, anyways, this was just kind of a an overview of that, that little shim program. You have your jump tables and then you would have to do some jump table um, manipulation when you load the programs. We're not entirely sure if this is going to work yet. Um, there's a lot of work here that we have to do. Um, this picture renders a lot nicer in the paper as well. So. All right, so Anjali. So, hello. Okay, so uh, PJ went over uh, one of the uh, problems um, in kind of passing the hints into the EBPF programs uh, that are containing the business logic uh, and, you know, the three approaches and we don't really know which way we'll we're going to go forward with it, but, you know, uh, that's uh, the part he was covering. Um, the part I am going to talk about is um, uh, how do I know what hints are useful for a given EBPF program and how does that, how does the driver get to know about it and program the hardware correctly? Um, so, uh, you know, one way uh, we could do this is using, again, uh, you know, the TC um, tools, uh, Flower or U32, whatever. Um, there are some obvious uh, issues here. Uh, first of all, any changes that we'll have to do to kind of implement actions for passing hints to the XDB program would require extensions to TC, which will require kernel changes. Um, and, you know, uh, it's one of the goals, as we highlighted earlier, we really want to minimize kernel changes for uh, taking benefit of the hardware hints. So, um, you know, there are definite limitations with uh, going ahead and programming the hardware using TC uh, to get the benefits. Um, uh, so we went ahead and uh, yeah. uh, so we went ahead and kind of imagined a different kind of uh, solution um, to kind of uh, you know uh, passing information to the driver so that it can generate the right kind of hints. And we believe uh, with this method, you have one-time changes into the kernel, but then for the long run, it just kind of um, uh, doesn't require any further changes, uh, even if, you know, th the kind of hints that are being delivered uh, uh, change as well as, uh, you know, your business logic changes and, you know. so. Uh, the proposal that we have is um, basically when um, you know your you write your um, business logic in C code for uh, and use the LV, uh, LLVM uh, to compile and generate the uh, the bytecode, which is the, the you know the L file. We basically stick the hints in uh, some special uh, header sections inside the L file um, itself. And, and, and then, uh, you know, those sections most likely are uh, skipped over by the file loader, the verifier, and stuff like that. Uh, and um, uh, some kind of an OS API will have to be developed. So it, uh, uh, when the, when the bytecode gets loaded into the kernel, uh, it kind of uh, extracts uh, the special uh, you know, the sections that are there in the EPF bytecode and 
you know, passes it over to the driver so that it can learn about what hints it should program in its programmable pipeline, uh, which will be usable for a given um, uh, business logic. Okay, so this slide is more about uh, what can we do right now in terms of hardware hints. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's based on what we understand is useful for most of the uh, use cases uh, out there which are doing uh, uh, packet processing uh, using the ABPF code. Um, so there are three different kinds of hardware hints that um, uh, we believe most hardware can pass. Um, one is the parsing hints, um, basically identifying the packet type, and that was, uh, again, one of the uh, benchmarking uh, data gathering that we did was using the first hint, which is just identifying what kind of packet it is, and so that the, the EPPF code doesn't have to kind of um, do that in software. Um, and then uh, the other two fo fall in the same category where a lot of these programs want a particular field extracted from the packet or uh, be able to uh, get to a particular offset in the packet so that it can very quickly, um, uh, you know, um, uh, either uh, use it for modifying the packet or uh, compare it against, uh, you know, uh, a value to kind of uh, decide the action further. Um, so those are the parsing hints that most hardware can provide, um, uh, including the Intel hardware that we have right now. Um, the other two categories um, uh, is more, uh, the bottom one is more about, um, you know, the compute kind of uh, hints, which is the hardware has already computed either the checks checksum on the packet or, uh, you know, the hash uh, on certain fields or, you know, it has marked the packet with a timestamp or something. And if that's useful for making decisions for the business logic, that's the other kind of hint that the hardware can provide. Uh, the middle one is more of, uh, uh, you know, this is similar to SKB mark um, uh, that we have where hardware can identify, uh, you know, a particular set of fields and match against values. Most hardware have a very huge lookup table, exact match or uh, LPM uh, table, uh, ACLs, whatnot. And it can use that to mark a particular flow with a software marker that gets passed as a hint um, to the EBPF program. And uh, uh, we believe uh, this one, uh, you know, the map offload would have, um, you know, uh, the longest bang for the buck kind of thing in terms of hints. Um, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, we can move on to the next one. Yeah. Up to up to now, I don't know how you're passing this in. So I know there's a buffer. Is it a TLV? What is it? So, uh, do you want to take that one? So you're referring to the the, the hints. So this would be part of that, that metadata field that we're hiding in the uh, XDP buffer headroom. But the layout of how we're going to actually pass that through is that's the TBD part. We, we currently have patches where we're just mem copying things out of our received descriptors into an opaque pointer that we define a struct, but that's not something that is upstreamable yet. Yeah, we, we definitely need to discuss this because what we did is we're assuming we're the uh, layout for right now where those hints are in the metadata and using it, but that isn't, it's not a hardware agnostic way of doing it. So, yeah. Um, okay, so uh, this is again going um, into how do I program my hardware to get the right kind of hints, and we believe we can use some ELF special headers to request these hints, and there are some examples of um, uh, of those. Um, you know, one of them could be uh, uh, give me the offset to the inner L4 header, and you could get that uh, you know programmed in the hardware, and then hardware can give you back uh, where the L4 header starts. You can get the p-type, or you could 
the last one is more about the SKB mark kind of thing that I was talking about, where you could define a packet match criteria and mark it with a particular ID, in this case, uh, 25 or something. And then you get that as part of your hint that it actually matched that particular um, uh, flow. OK, so um, uh, based on what I was describing earlier, we will have to somehow get that information about the special headers that are in the ELF file into the driver um, for the driver to be able to program it. And so we will have to you know, introduce a new NDO op of some sort to get the XDP hints uh, and program the hardware accordingly. Um, and I think PJ uh, mentioned that all of this is best effort, which means that when I um, call from my driver to get the XDP hints, I may or may not be able to program all of those in my hardware, and I do the best effort to program as many as I can. And uh, you know, we will have to have some way of uh, indicating into software saying, you know, this was accelerated uh, by the hardware versus the other has to be. Uh, has to go through the regular software path. Okay. Okay, so to wrap up, uh, this is kind of the next steps, and so this goes to your question. Uh, you may have been peeking into the matrix, but um, so the next things that we really want to do is is continue to do the performance characterizations. Um, like I had mentioned before, we need to test on newer hardware. We need to make some changes to our test rigs to remove that um, that uh, artificial headroom on that NIC that we were using. Um, and we need to test with more uh, types of XDB programs. Uh, and then this is the next two pieces are the things that I think everyone here is more interested in. Um, start providing some prototypes of what we've been coming up with uh, as RFC patches, both the hardware hint programming model that Anjali just described. Um, that's going to be a pretty big lift since it touches you know, the whole tool chain from LLVM down through the kernel. Um, but in order to have a meaningful discussion, I think we have to provide some code. Uh, and then um, the last one is, yes, we need to figure out how is this metadata going to look and how do we pass it back and forth in the XDB buff. So, Yeah, so there's plenty of time, so we can ask. You, you want to talk first? Okay, so, um, yeah, there are two pieces, right? One is how do you know what... If, even if it's an SKB mark, what the data path was doing with it, and what is what is that data path telling you? The SKB mark means that's one, but also I, I, I guess it's very difficult for hardware to pass TLVs because then then you can you can give because we do this in IFE, which is a TC action, which you basically define a T to mean uh, each SK, each metadata has an ID. Mm -hmm. The ID gets defined is uh, standardized, so everybody knows what the ID is. Or you could have some vendor spec where everybody defines their own space that only they understand, but they can share that with other people. But th there's a space wh which is standardized, right? So, but, uh, but I understand that a lot of people in the hardware community don't like to use TLVs. Maybe you are, Nick can do it, or? We, we, we do use TLVs uh, in the context of things like DCB, um, where, we're okay. where so we don't you have a choice. <laughs> Okay, but because it, it will make sense to at least uh, s uh, pass a big buffer of all the of TLVs where the type identifies the metadata type, the value has the metadata value, and then you could one option is to standardize specific types that everybody agrees to an SKB mark or. So yeah, in that in that case, then we would we would need to figure out a place to stick those TLVs to pass them into XTP, right? Right now, I thought that buffer it comes from the drive from the hardware. Right? It may not be big enough, depending on how I you see. define the TLVs. Okay, but but I I, I mean I'm not discounting yeah. the yeah. So t take a look at IFE and how we do things. Then. But here to your first one. Yeah. So, so this this here Jamal is um, kind of outlining how that mark would work or how we're envisioning it would work. So the type of the hint would be if you have a packet match, right? Um, and if it matches that tuple that's passed in, then the result is 25, arbitrary number, right? This, your flow ID, or, um, and then that's the mark, and the size is U32, so we would define where in that metadata struct that would be defined. 
So then if we saw 25, we knew that we hit a packet match based on that tuple. So very arbitrary. So, so uh, while I was watching Lawrence's presentation on TCP BPF, I had a bit of an epiphany about something that could simplify what you guys are doing for at least the two, bu two bubbles at the top of that slide you were just showing. The places, the, the situations where we're, we're interested in a particular specific well-defined field in the headers and we would like to just load it and inspect it in some way. Okay, and this, this would obviate the need for the special ELF section because this is why I like this idea. So in things like TCP, BPF, the canonical way to handle this situation in BPF is that you have an abstract structure, like a struct SOC XTP or mm -hmm. whatever. Like so here we would have our st struct XTP HW hints, right? And this would be relative to the data meta. I got it right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The data meta pointer. So each access to data meta as a XTP hints structure type. So you have this structure that is like U16 P type, U16 inner L4, blah, 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 blah. So when you load the program into the kernel, it scans for all the loads done relative to that context pointer, mm -hmm. right? And if it sees an, an access to X, it'll translate that into a, wherever you put that field in hardware. So at program load time, we rewrite the load instructions, the BPF load instructions, so that they actually access the place where you really put the metadata field into the metadata area of the packets, whatever you configured the program, the hardware to do, or whatever it's capable of, okay? And so then when, you, when, when the program gets loaded with the existing NDO XDP operation, you have the program, and we could have some auxiliary data of the rewritten load instructions, and you could therefore know exactly what fields were accessed and wh wh what they need to get rewritten to. So if you do things that from that approach, you don't need the ELF section for that. But for the match stuff, that's a totally different animal altogether. So you may be able to get a, a quick prototype of the, the loading, f accessing fields bit, just using the instruction rewrite stuff, and then you could look into using ELF sections maybe for the, the matching aspect. So, so that would kind of be a hybrid between the first and second approaches, where the first one was defining a struct. Right. Um, it's an abstract it struct. And accesses to them indicate an interest in field X. Right, and then the, the second one was you have something in BPF that's actually doing some magic populating the field, so it's kind of a mix of the two. Right, and this also gives you flexibility in the software fallback as well. Yes, and that's one thing that we did not have well-defined in either of those. Yeah. Right, so anyways, just think about that. I like it. Anybody else? And it's being recorded, so I, I, can, I can refer to mm -hmm. it later. Is there any presumption that this is Ethernet centric or is it applicable to IP, IPv6 network devices where you just get IP packets? There isn't a presumption. There isn't one. There's no presumption, okay. No. Good. And Thank there you. was another question that somebody had asked earlier um, in the hallway. It was about uh, is there a way I could um, reprogram the parser in the hardware using this and so that I can use my own protocol types and stuff like that. Uh, I, we haven't really looked into it, so we will think about it. Yeah, I mean, the, the thing is that if you know how to parse your packet apart, if you know what's going to be where in, in your, your data streams, then there's, you get a pointer to your packet buffer and you just start tearing it apart. Yeah, it really doesn't matter what's there. Any other questions? Yes, please. Um, how are you going to take an eBPF program and understand from it, from a general program, what you want to configure the hardware? So that's the problem that we were trying to solve. In some way, if the, the ELF header file that is being generated, if it can give me information on what hints are useful for that program, then I can program my hardware and, you know, um, that's the part that uh, Dave was suggesting. There's probably a mixed approach. There is something that I can implicitly drive, and I don't need these special header sections in the ELF, elf file. Uh, although for things like um, you know flow match, uh, a, a kind of thing, we might have to add those headers, uh, those sections in the header. 
Okay, because uh, ABPF program can be something that's read a generic code that's just modifying the packet and then asking a question about the packet. So it could be that you need to reclassify the packet after the change. So you need to understand, really look on the, on the program to understand what it's doing. And well, but that, that's the case for any of them right now, right? I mean, no, right now you take the eBPF code and run it. Uh, that's true, Rani. So if you go back to the initial slide, we said we're not going to, we're trying to solve some of the problems, uh, you know, some of the things that the eBPF program does and not some of those, like packet manipulation is something we're really not um, taking into account. And most of the, I mean, programs that I, you know, I have been looking at, it's like you classify before manipulation, mani manipulating the packet, and then you classify after you've made the changes. This is pre-manipulation of the packet that I can classify, like the packet as it, as it came in. So, so th this is also intended that if you were going to change your target hint fields that you are interested in, you would reload the program with a different set of hints. Yep. Okay, so someone need to, to, have it to, to give the hints. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Over here. There's one here. Come on. Uh, okay. Are you on board, Ronnie? <laughs> Would there be a way to modify whatever information is passed to the XDP program so that further chained programs don't wind up getting wrong information from the hardware after a previous program has invalidated it. Uh, if I have an original program that's designed to do something, if it's IPv6 or IPv4, and then I make some program that decides to translate a packet from IPv4 to IPv6, and I simply insert that in front of the chain, Next program goes, oh, hardware said it's IPv4, but I've actually changed it to be IPv6, and that's no longer correct. So, so this would be if you manipulate the packet, but you're potentially having stale data in your metadata pointer? Is that, okay. Um, in that case, typically when we're modifying the packet, the reason that that headroom is there is to extend the headers. So in that case, I mean, we haven't thought about it, but thinking about it kind of off the top of my head, we would just invalidate the metadata pointer at that point as we extend the headers. And then it, software would have to parse it, but that, that's a good point. <coughs> Any other questions? We've got two minutes and 27 seconds. Yeah. My question regarding the performance testing, the, the big boost is due to reduction of, of the data cache miss in your test. So this specific BPF program that you tested is, may not work like others say on other programs, like the performance boost. Uh, so that, yeah. So that, that, that's the whole reason that uh, the, the top bullets, um, especially the still need to test with more complex XDP programs. Um, because of that limitation of the NIC, we're not really sure where that upper limit is. Uh, we, we do believe it's quite a bit higher than that 21 million and some change. Um, but we, we need to test it, right? We need to test with like a load balancer, an end cap, decap. Um, I'm hoping <laughs> that we still get some good performance out of it, but at this point we can't extrapolate. We just didn't have enough time to do the testing. But it is something that we're committed to doing. Got one more minute. Thank you.